I want to share two stories with you. Both are from sacred scriptures. The first comes from Jewish and Christian scriptures, and it's the story of Dina. You may never have heard of Dina. There is no tribe named after this child of Israel. There is no book in the Bible dedicated to her ministry or her prophetic words. We don't often talk about ourselves in Jewish and Christian traditions as followers of the God of Hagar, Leah, and Dina. But her story is there in these sacred scriptures. And in one chapter of Genesis, we have a window of opportunity to hear about Dina's story. Who is Dina? Dina is Leah's daughter, the daughter of Leah and Jacob. You may remember Leah, Rachel, and Jacob, the biblical love triangle. Leah and Rachel are daughters of Laban. Jacob sees Rachel across a crowded field with the sheep and decides he wants to marry her. So he makes an agreement with her father, Laban, that he will work seven years in order to marry Rachel. When the time comes, Laban insists that Jacob marry Leah, the older, uglier sister. So Jacob works seven more years so he can marry Rachel. Jacob loves Rachel, but only Leah can have children. So Leah has a number of boys. And Rachel becomes jealous and prays that God will allow her to have children. So Rachel has some sons. Then Leah gets jealous and gives her concubine to Jacob, and the concubine has some sons. And then Rachel gets jealous and gives her concubine to Jacob to have some more sons. And so here we have two women fighting over one man, trying to hold on to his love by having children. It's like a modern-day talk show. At least this is how the scripture describes. And at the end of all this, the scripture tells us, by the way, Leah had a daughter named Dina. So here we have Dina, the baby girl of the ugly, unwanted wife of Jacob. And when we meet Dina, she's a young woman, probably a teenager. And based on the information given in this text, Dina is the only girl child that Jacob has. So here we have Dina living day in and day out in a house full of boys. And Dina goes out to see the daughters of the land. She goes out to see the other women in Canaan. Dina leaves this Hebrew campsite to find some female company in the area. I mean, who could blame her? <laughs> some translations suggest that Dina went out to minister to the women in the land. I imagine she just wanted to find some sister friends. Someone who could braid and curl her hair, someone to help her fix her clothes, someone with whom she could giggle and relax. And Dina is out in the neighborhood hanging with her girlfriends, and while she is there, a man named Shechem sees her and rapes her. And when Dina's father Jacob finds out that Dina has been raped, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't do anything. And Shechem decides that he loves Dina and wants to marry her. When Shechem decides he wants to marry Dina, he sends his father to Jacob, and Jacob begins to set the, the bride price. Aware the violation has just occurred to his daughter, Jacob begins to barter with Shechem's family. In return for peaceful international relations, Jacob tells Shechem that he can marry Dina if he agrees to be circumcised like the Hebrews are. And in return, the Hivites and the Hebrews will share land and prosperity and friendship. And in anger, Dina's brothers tell their father Jacob that he is treating Dina like a harlot. Jacob is trying to sell his daughter to the Canaanites for cattle and penal foreskin. <laughs> Why? Maybe Jacob, like his father-in-law Laban, thinks that Dina, like her mother Leah, will never be loved on her own merit. Maybe Jacob thinks that Dina is too ugly, too stupid, too slow, too spoiled, too something, and cannot find a man on her own. Maybe Jacob thinks that he can control Dina's life better than she can. Either way, Jacob buys into Shechem's lie and he's willing to barter his daughter for this comfort of a village of men. Unbeknownst to Jacob and the Hivites, Dina's brothers, Simeon and Levi, plan to slaughter all the Hivites while they're recovering from the circumcision. <laughs> you know, they're adults, no anesthesia. <laughs> Meanwhile, no one hears from Dina. We haven't heard from Dina since the first verse. While the men are off planning and plotting, bartering and exchanging and engaging in international relations and economic negotiations, no one has noticed Dina's absence. No one acknowledges Dina's tears. No one has asked about Dina's whereabouts. Dina does not appear till the 26th verse 
we learn that she has been in Shechem's house the entire time. I have been telling this story for over 20 years because I believe that religious activism is about listening to the voices we don't hear, about looking for who is not there, about searching for the absences and the gaps, about finding the women in the homes of their tormentors and naming injustice where we find it. I believe that we heal our wounds when we ask, how might our spiritualities be different if we had noticed Dina the way we notice Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses? What kinds of questions might we ask? What did Dina feel? What would Dina have said? What would Dina have liked for her community to do? And where was Dina's God in her pain? What might Dina have asked for? And what does the ancestral voice of Dina say to me now? And when we ask ourselves how, in both shame and compassion, we didn't know about Dina. This is sacred women's wisdom, to acknowledge that we sometimes overlook and silence our Dinas but don't want to, to give voice and response to stories that we don't always hear about. And religious activism is fueled by the sacred feminine, acknowledges the ugliness in our tradition, and looks within that same tradition for hope and healing. It also means we cannot do to our own Dinas what was done to the biblical Dina, It's easy to be angry and want to seek revenge. It's easy to get caught up in learning about and negotiating legalities and technicalities that result from the experiences of violence. And when we learn more about sexual violence, it's easy for us to assume that we know what needs to be done and making sure it happens. And when we do these things, we are no better than Dina's brothers, father, and Shechem's family. What we must do is attend to our Dinas. We must see Dina as the real life people in our midst. Sometimes we are Dina. We have to talk with our Dinas, sit with our Dinas through their pain, and ask our Dinas what it is they have experienced and with what they still struggle. We need to be for our Dinas what the biblical Dina did not have. And we need to ask our Dinas what they want and what they need. Well, let me share another sacred story. In 1993, Octavia Butler published a dystopic science fiction novel called Parable the Sower, that portrays a 21st century California of decay and chaos through the eyes of African-American teenage protagonist Lauren Oya Olamina. Written in diary format, the novel unfolds through Lauren's recordings of her thoughts and life events from age 15 in 2024 to age 18 in 2027. And when we enter the story, Lauren and her family lived in a walled neighborhood in Robledo, California, a fictional suburb of Los Angeles. There's been a major breakdown in the U.S. infrastructure. Police and firefighters charge fines and harass and rob citizens. Labor laws are relaxed, there's no minimum wage. Slavery has been revived through company store corporations. State borders are closed to out-of-state residents. Drugs, poverty, and rape are so commonplace that people carry guns to leave their own neighborhoods and are not surprised at the sight of human corpses in their midst. Everyone except the poor and the homeless live in walled neighborhoods. Outside the walls, people are poor, illiterate, jobless, and without water. When Lauren's neighborhood is invaded and destroyed, she begins to walk north toward Oregon, where jobs pay money, as compared to room and board, or company script, and water is more accessible. In the process, she meets people who join her in her journey. New members join the community when the surrounding environment impinges on their journey, after an earthquake, when they intervene in an attempted robbery, after a night of gunfighting, And when they begin their walk, they are a group of ragtag survivors trying to stay alive and get to a better place. In the process, the travelers adhere to an ethic of inclusion and mutual care. And interwoven in Lauren's diary is a philosophical theology she has discovered. And she calls this God is changed theology, Earth Seed. As more people join her in the journey north, she teaches Earth Seed. And at the end of the novel, the Earth Seed community settles on the remnants of an old farm belonging to one of the travelers and they call that community Acorn. And the context of Parable of the Sower is framed by the presence and the role of the Yoruba-based Orisha Oya. In traditional Yoruba religion, which is from the West West African community that is now in Nigeria, Oya is the Yoruba Orisha of change. Oya is the Orisha of change represented in radical weather conditions. Oya is represented in several natural forms, wind, especially tornadoes, fire, the river, and the African buffalo. 
or Yah is the lightning that is partnered with the elements of thunder and rain. Or Yah is the mother of the Agungun, the masquerade of masks that honors our familial ancestors. Or Yah is a guardian to the realm of the ancestors. Or Yah brings the voice of those ancestors that preserve the wisdom that leads to development of good character. Or Yah is the most powerful female Orisha and is well known for her sense of justice and intolerance for the abuse and oppression of women. Oya's presence can be destructive or creative, depending on whether humans honor or ignore her. When honored, she will produce creative changes in the world, and when ignored, she is angered and may manifest herself destructively. According to one Yerba priest, neglect is a result of society's embrace of greed and individualism and the failure to appreciate the ancient spirits. But when she's honored, Oya can provide the fires that nourish, the winds that cleanse and establish meteorological climates, and guide one in the transition from mortal to ancestor and from ancestor to veneration. Oya reminds us that not only do we live within whirlwinds of changing conditions, but that divine itself can be both an author and recipient of change. Well, in her quest for a theology appropriate for her context, Lauren begins to describe the way she sees the world working around her. She analyzes other people, herself, everything she can read, hear, and see, and all the history she can learn. And she discovers this theology is all about change, a symbiotic relationship between God and the world. And she makes this conclusion about the world. Whether you are a human being, an insect, a microbe, or a stone, this is true. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change, God is change. For Lauren, change is the most common denominator in everything in the world. And Earthsea teaches that God influences the world and the world influences God. The central verse of Earthsea reads, why is the universe to shape God? Why is God to shape the universe? Earthsea's God is always influencing the world. She says, God has been here all along, shaping us and being shaped by us in no particular way or in too many ways at once, like an amoeba, or like a cancer. God's influence and shaping occur with or without acknowledgement of the world. It's just part of how the world works. And so Lauren says, as wind, as water, as fire, as life, God is both creative and destructive, demanding and yielding, sculptor and clay. God is infinite potential. God is change. Well, this too is women's sacred wisdom. Octavia Butler's Afro-futurist speculative insight about what could happen or what should happen if we don't creatively transform our world. And the wisdom of a black teenage girl, an unlikely prophet, guided by her ancestor to both embrace and change her beliefs in the world. And so I believe this is a vision of the world with women's sacred wisdom, that our fictional imaginings are as holy, maybe more, than the canonical scriptures approved by councils of men that we can find the holy in the whirlwind, the fire, the past, and our everyday saviors. We may look to those we least suspect to be our leaders, that women and girls of color may lead us, that the ancestors will guide us forward, that the female goddess of wind and change is emblematic of the way we work, of the way the worlds work, and that she must be honored, and that our path toward healing is a way that is walked, not only in the silences and the gaps and the voiceless, but also in poetry, community, change, difficult choices, and with the feminist God. Thank you. I have to observe just in the process of uh, curating this festival with my colleagues. Uh, this term of who saw Dina has been paramount in our thinking mm -hmm. and this recognition that there's almost a uh, cultural or collective blindness. And then once your sight is restored, uh, you just see this richness of, of Dina and what she has to teach us over time. So I, I loved that story. <laughs> Does anyone else have any? Reflection before we hear from woman <laughs> stand shining. <laughs> I love it too, um, and I couldn't help but think hearing you to speak about Octavia Butler, mm -hmm. about um, Margaret Atwood, right, and the the capacity that fiction has to illuminate the truth of what is 
in a, in a different way than we get to see any other way. And also just that um, in both cases with Dina and, and um, the parable of the sower, we're seeing the value of the, of the perspective and the experience and the voice that's been hidden and invisibilized. And that, that I think there's something incredibly relevant to that, the moment of history that we're in, mm -hmm. in that we need to be led by those who, whose experience in a way has been hardest mm -hmm. and who therefore carry the wisdom for how to lead in a totally different way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's like a different way of listening and yeah. hearing. Uh, I think, like mm -hmm. listening for what's not there and then yeah. seeing it rise up, right? Listening for who's not listened to and looking for who's yeah. usually invisible and seeing that rise up as well. I, I also just want to say I was really struck by recognizing how um, so often the value to our human experience lies in the wound, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and that as a culture we tend to shove our wounds under the rug mm -hmm. and not really face them and not value them and that that's... That's a part of restoring the feminine, I think, is how we value what's been most painful and traumatic for us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, I, I was also appreciating um, the way that you're holding, you were holding this biblical mm. viewpoint and then an indigenous mm. viewpoint. And I feel like that is something that indigenous culture has to offer to this time of where, where I'm, I'm praying and hoping that we are all ready to collectively put our cards on the table, yeah. right? And, and so when, when, indigenous, when that indigenous eye comes to look at systems that have held all of the conversation, we'll say, yeah. and say, well, what about this? Because from our stories, we would be wondering, well, what happened to that woman? Like, where, where did she go, what, you know? And, and so I feel like that's where our diversity in faith um, will strengthen our understanding of ourselves and our view of many of the stories that we've, that we've held. Yeah. So I was just appreciating that, yeah. Mm -hmm.